when Emma was up here earlier, she she uh, welcomed a number of individuals that had come from uh, uh, far places to join us this evening. Uh, when I had first became active with the St. Andrews Society of Detroit, one of the things that uh, I had done in conjunction with then President Scott David was work on developing a tartan for the St. Andrews Society, a Michigan tartan that we had actively got the state of Michigan to adopt. Well, one of our guests tonight is a weaver. Um, uh, uh, Claire Campbell uh, is going to be one of our panelists tomorrow. She came from Scotland, and Claire's back at this table. I wanted to welcome Claire tonight as well. Thank you for joining us, Claire. We're going to begin the program, and I want to start that by introducing to you Camilla Hellman. Uh, Camilla has had a career spanning both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, that really has been the substance of her career, to kind of provide a bridge uh, between uh, Scotland and the United States. And in that context, she became uh, a part of the uh, American Scottish Foundation, first as a development director, then subsequently, beginning last year, as the director of uh, the foundation. And I want to tell you, as, as you work with Camilla, you find out, first of all, she's got a ton, a ton, and a ton of energy. And uh, she, she is determined to make something happen. And, uh, you know, an event like this can't, can't happen without that kind of energy and that commitment to get something done. So, Cabell, I want to thank you for all your effort, but as well to introduce you to this conference tonight. And, Camilla, come on up and thank you. And uh, here's Camilla Hellman. Good evening. And I'm delighted to be back in Detroit. At the, and now it's arguably whether it's the 18th or 19th annual Scottish North American Leadership Conference. And I was told that you, Gus, will be able to tell us which it is. Um, we'll, we'll discuss it tomorrow. <laughs> um, the Scottish North American Leadership Conference, when I first came here about 10 years ago, I realized how important collaboration was between all of us. And the opportunity for us to meet and talk sometimes with people we don't see for an, another year. And um, I feel that we, and one of those very important things is when we, are, that we have the opportunity to have one of the members of the Scottish government um, join us here and give us insight. And um, so I'm very honored to be able to uh, introduce Rory Hadley, who is the second secretary for Scottish Affairs in Washington, D.C. And just um, as you heard earlier, Rory's just arrived. This is his first trip to the Midwest as well, um, <laughs> and to all of us. But also, Rory, to thank you on behalf of all of us here for the support we've had from the Scottish government this year, which has enabled us, as was mentioned, to put together the YouTube webinar link up with, Scott, uh, with um, our panelists tomorrow to be able to promote the conference out to a greater audience. And this is a first step in that wider um, remit that we want to have to draw more people in. And part of our commitment to bringing the next generation in and to feel included in what we're doing. So without more ado, Rory? Could you join us? Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? Everybody understand my accent? I apologize in advance. I, I have been told that um, I, I sometimes speak too quickly, so I'll, 
I'll dumb it down. Um, and, and thanks for that introduction, Camilla. Um, I seem to be saying thank you to Camilla a lot over these four months because she's been uh, such a big help since I arrived. Um, what I like to do when I come to a new place is I like to make a couple of observations. The first one was I spent all of school avoiding going to a library. I was here for five minutes and Camilla dragged me to a library. Although I could spend hours in there. Um, and the other thing was just to say that the orchestra was fantastic. Between that and the discussion with the musicians at uh, my table, I am definitely talentless. Um, so it's an enormous pleasure to be here with you all um, to allow the Scottish Government to continue to support the conference. Um, I'd like to pass on my thanks to the organisers for putting together the programme, for allowing me to participate and of course hang in the saltire so I knew where to go. Um, for those of you that I have yet to meet, um, I am Rory Heatherley. Um, I'm the new, if I can still say that after four months, um, Deputy Head of the Scottish Affairs Office based in DC, or Second Secretary, as Camilla said, to use my diplomatic title. Um, I want to quickly offer uh, our apologies from Joni Smith, who's the head of the office. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. Both of our schedules, as you can imagine, being a team of two, um, are incredibly busy just now, and I know she would have been here if it was at all possible. So I am afraid that you're stuck with me. Um, I knew, taking this job up four months ago, that it would probably end up being the best job I ever have, and that view's not changed yet. My job, in a nutshell, is to showcase Scotland as the best place to live, work, invest, and visit. Not something I necessarily need to convince many of you in this room about. And I love looking around the room and seeing the traditional Scottish dress. It's always a special to put on the kilt, celebrate all things Scottish with our friends in the US. Um, though I must say, at this exact moment last week, I was in California wearing a kilt with flip-flops and sunglasses. So you're gonna have to do something about the weather. Um, <laughs> it, it felt like Scotland, rain. Uh, I love having the opportunity to showcase all things uh, Scottish. Um, and as I said, the kilt is always an easy sell. Um, the three-person Loch Ness Monster Halloween costume that I'm currently building, maybe not so cut and dry. Um, I'm constantly amazed at how hard-working and proud our diaspora networks are, the length and breadth of the US. I mentioned I was in Southern California last week, and in the four months I've already had amazing conversations with our diaspora in San Francisco, Houston, Maine, LA, Ventura, Richmond, New York, and I'll shortly be in Boston and Chicago. So I get about, I just need to convince the government to get me my own plane and we'll be sorted. Um, but on a serious note, getting to meet and work with you is a, is a privilege, and I mean that from, from the bottom of my heart. Um, without all you guys act as, as ambassadors for Scotland, our work from the government side would not be anywhere near as straightforward or rewarding. So just to warn you, um, over the course of tonight and tomorrow, you're going to hear me say thank you a lot based in, entirely on that fact. Um, I was excited to see the theme of this year's uh, conference, and I know that we'll get into the detail of that tomorrow, um, focusing on the next generation. Um, and what is the year of young people for the Scottish Government? That theme chimes well. Um, immediately before taking up post in the US, I was responsible for our First Minister Nicola Sturgeon's engagement strategy, and her desire to empower young people was an area of work which not only made sense, but also gave me a lot of satisfaction in the orchestra is the epitome of what the Year of Young People is, so um, I hope to see them numerous times over my time here um, in the US over the next four years. Um, seeing the look on the next generation's face as we give them the opportunities and the guidance to help shape their lives and achieve their dreams, um, and of course seeing the look on the adults' faces when we realise we're actually learning from them. Not only do you all set the standard as role models, the ability to pass on your passion about all things Scottish is an asset that we need to harness for generations to come. Your enthusiasm, your champion of Scotland's history, heritage and culture continues to strengthen Scotland's voice on the international stage and that is truly invaluable. For a small country, we've made a big impact on the world and my work is to continue to build on that by promoting the very best of Scotland across the US. And that's, of course, made easier by all of you in here. I want to finish my remarks tonight, and we'll, I, I said we'll get into the detail tomorrow, so you will have to hear my dulcet Scottish tones for a lot longer. But I want to finish um, by sharing a statistic with you, one that I've stolen from the First Minister, so you may have heard it before. But, um, and, and if you have, I apologise for that, but please don't tell her. 
Here in the US, there is as many as 25 million people who enjoy some degree of Scottish ancestry. In fact, from time to time, there are various surveys which suggest that it's almost 30 million in the US that claim Scots or Scots-Irish ancestry. However, official census figures show that there's actually only around 10 million who actually have Scots or Scots-Irish ancestry. What that shows me is there are 20 million people in America who aren't actually Scottish but want to be. It's a great compliment to the work you do to promote Scotland in the US, but it's also an, op an excellent opportunity to keep selling Scotland. As an open and welcoming nation, we take the approach if you want to be Scottish, you can be, and I know that's a sentiment shared by you all. I look forward to sharing with you some of the detail of the work we're doing as the Scottish government in the US, but more than anything, I look forward to hearing from you about how we can support you in the already amazing job that you're already doing. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening. I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow. Um, I have what I believe a very exciting film to show you. Um, some of you might have already seen it, but be sure to catch the session in the morning. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, I've had the good fortune over the last several years uh, to work with uh, the next gentleman, uh, John King Bellasai. We are both, uh, John is the president of the Council of Scottish Clans and Associations. I serve as the vice president of the organization. If you are active in a clan organization, you know the struggles that we have had with trying to build membership and engage with all the activities that are expected of any clan organization it is always a challenge. But one of the things that make, make it possible for a clan leadership to do their job is, is COSCA. It really is the professional association for clans. And uh, an organization is only as good as its leader. And John does an outstanding job on behalf of Casca. And John, I want to say thank you for that, but also to invite you here to the podium, uh, John Bellasai. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And I did not pay him to say that. Um, but I really enjoy working with him. Um, he's a great guy. And you're very fortunate to have him here in Detroit. Um, <clears throat> I, I am a past president of my local St. Andrews Society in Washington, D.C., as is my friend Bart Forbes here. And we're remarking on how fortunate you are. And that's a 250-year-old society with a lot of cachet and we do a lot of things and we're there in the nation's capital but we don't have a physical presence we don't have a headquarters and um, I think if we had it to do all over again from an offer 30 years ago maybe we should have taken it but we didn't so you are very fortunate to have this facility I've been here before and it's nice warm cozy good place to meet always great food um, and um, <clears throat> It's a valuable thing. So I salute you for, for having it and holding on to it. I'm sure it's got its headaches associated with it. Uh, but uh, don't ever let go of it, because it's, I was talking to your president about it. It's pretty unique. I think there are only three or four, Gus Noble in Chicago is one of them, who have a physical plant uh, in which the St. Andrews Society can meet. But um, congratulations. And congratulations uh, to your president on her um, her term. Uh, we're talking about some of the things she wants to accomplish and sounds fairly familiar and I know that uh, she's got her work cut out for her but you know if you don't if you don't try to move the ball down the field what's the point right? We're all in it together. Um, I've been asked to introduce uh, Kirsten Bridier who um, <coughs> is with us and had a chance to talk to her over dinner. I met her 
uh, Grandfather Mountain Highland Games back in July. We talked briefly at the Scottish Heritage USA um, reception. And um, Kirsten tells me she's three years into the job now um, as Executive Director of the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA. Long name. She's going to tell us what that is and how it interfaces with the National Trust for Scotland in Scotland. Um, but there is a U.S. presence and a U.S. entity, and I'm, I'm going to resist being a lawyer and telling you about the significance of that, but, but she'll tell you a little bit about that, um, I'm sure. And it raises funds and visibility in the U.S. for the work of Scotland's largest conservation charity, which is the National Trust for Scotland. If you've ever been to Scotland, and most of you have, and you've visited National Trust properties, you know how special they are. Um, and she gets to work with them, which is pretty good. Um, Kirsten has significant experience in historic preservation and nonprofit management, serving as the curator of education for the Nantucket Historical Association. That's previous to her current job. During the renovation and reinterpretation of its flagship whaling museum, and leading corporate and foundation giving for the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She's a Bostonian. Um, Kirsten attended Smith College and holds a Master's in Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her Scottish ancestry is via Clan Curry, and we were just talking about that. As many of you know, uh, Lord Lyon uh, Morrow just uh, recognized uh, the Currys as a clan um, uh, just a couple of months ago. And Bob Curry, who many of us know, is now recognized as commander. That's something that's been going on for quite some time. Our congratulations to Bob and to the Currys uh, for that level. I mean, they were always there. I mean, you know, every family is an old family. They've been around a long time. They've been associated with the McDonald's for a long time. They've done a lot of things. But the fact that they are now recognized as a clan society in their own right is a special recognition. So congratulations to all the Currys. Um, first thing. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I've heard about this event um, ever since uh, joining the team at the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA in Boston three years ago. And um, thank you so much to the St. Andrews Society of Detroit for your hospitality this evening. So this is not Scotland. <laughs> wanna... um, this is Middleton Place, a historic plantation located outside of Charleston, South Carolina. I'm starting with Middleton Place because it holds a very special place in my heart. It's the first historic site I remember visiting. I was in kindergarten. I was five years old and I very clearly remember walking down a broad staircase made of grass. I had never seen anything like it before. It was so strange to me and so beautiful. I was holding my father's hand and we walked together to the water and swans. Forty years later, I've built a career in the world of art and history museums. In all that time, I've never been back to Middleton Place. But the memory of that visit evokes a feeling in me that I'm quite certain you all have felt, maybe in the US or maybe in Scotland. That's for you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's a feeling of connection, of belonging to something bigger than myself, a feeling of stepping back in time, of entering a whole new world, a feeling of authenticity. That is the power of place. That is the power of objects and the stories they tell. And I believe that that is how we best connect ourselves and the next generation to our heritage. I had the opportunity to attend the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games in North Carolina this summer. And while I was there, I was struck by a number of things. First, how very connected attendees who had never visited Scotland were with their ancestral clan, especially through wearing their tartan, a physical symbol of where they came from and where they belonged. 
Second, I heard the wonderful story of a man who had found, purchased, restored, and now lived in the home that his ancestors had built in the mountains of North Carolina after emigrating from Scotland more than two centuries ago. Talk about a tangible connection to your heritage. And lastly, there was a woman who came up to me in the booth where I was working and said to me, is there such a thing as genetic memory? Because I felt it when I was there. I felt it in my bones. I don't know much about DNA, but I do know that a recent marketing study found that tourists who visit Scotland associated that visit with an intense feeling of being at home. And interestingly, this was a feeling that visitors to Ireland did not describe having. So it seems to me that we in this room are pretty uniquely positioned to make profound connections between people and place, ensuring that this remarkable heritage is understood, appreciated, and deeply felt by the next generation. So the organization um, for which I raise funds, the National Trust for Scotland, is literally transferring cultural heritage through a number of programs that provide young Scots with hands-on apprenticeships in historic building and gardening techniques. At Culleen Castle in South Ayrshire, the Trust has built its own team of in-house stonemasons who are skilled with working with the local sandstone. They are trained in historic techniques and the use of historic tools. Apprentices work alongside the stonemasons, learning about hand tooling, carving, and the use of lime mortars in the same way that their ancestors may have before them. Teaching traditional skills makes preservation possible. Instead of contracting outside laborers to maintain the walls, chimneys, and viaducts at Culleen, the trust saves money and invests in the future by giving young people from across Scotland access to the skills they need for a career in historic preservation. And the money that might have been spent on contractors can go to restoring other parts of the property, like the walled kitchen garden, which is a project we're currently funding. For nearly 60 years, the Trust has offered a school of heritage gardening at Threve Garden and Estate in Dumfries and Galloway. Each year, about five students enroll to pursue a one-year certificate in heritage horticulture, or a two-year diploma in heritage gardening. These young people learn the art, craft, and science of horticulture. They graduate ready to work for the trust, to maintain one of its 35 gardens, or move on to share their learning at heritage gardens across the United Kingdom. Look how happy they are. <laughs> but the trust has recently embarked on a number of initiatives meant to encourage recent visitation um, by different local constituency, families. This makes good business sense for the trust. Every time they visit, as you all know, parents and their children will grab a snack in the cafe or a souvenir at the gift shop, but it's really about more than that. It's about connecting families with their authentic cultural heritage and encouraging them to make their own meaning and their own memories, just like I did with my dad at Middleton Place. Colleen Castle, which we just saw, is one of tr many traditional historic sites that has benefited from the installation of a historically themed play park geared to local children. This is called Adventure Cove, and it was paid for by gifts from Americans through the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA. The playground takes its inspiration from the site itself. It recreates part of Colleen Castle, its viaduct, a smuggler's cave, and in honor of the Castle's connection to the U.S., it has an Eisenhower. Um, the top floor of Colleen was given to General Eisenhower uh, in thanks um, from the Scottish people for his work during World War II. This year, Colleen has experienced a 77% increase in visitation, with member visits increasing by 31%. So this is an investment in the future of the site that is paying off and the Trust is now installing themed play parks at many of its flagship sites, including Crathis, Brody, and Brodick Castles, to serve as a resource for and more deeply engage local families. Like so many historic sites and museums across the world, the National Trust for Scotland is experimenting with bringing history to life for children via hands-on experiences and what I would call a judicious use of technology. 
At the Bannockburn Visitor Center, which opened in 2014, school groups have the opportunity to dress in period costumes and then to learn about medieval combat via a 3D immersive experience. The use of technology is particularly appropriate at this site because Bannockburn is not one of the Trust's most authentic sites. Unlike Culloden Battlefield, this visitor center is located near where the historic battle occurred seven centuries ago. So in this case, the technology is not replacing something authentic or real. The Trust has also used technology in a different way at Falkland Palace. A few years ago, we, we partnered with students from nearby St. Andrews University to create a light show for the town's winter festival. So even if you'd been to Falkland Palace before, the light show highlighted its architecture and moments from its history in an entirely new, entirely beautiful way. And technology is providing a means for asking trust visitors and not just museum experts what makes Scotland so special. So this is the Seed Pod. The Seed Pod is a mobile video booth that has traveled to 18 different trust properties this year. And nearly 700 people have recorded videos describing what they love and hate about Scotland. Unsurprisingly, the country's history and heritage was voted its number one love, followed by the coastline, wildlife, <clears throat> landscape, and arts and culture. The weather and midges did not fare as well. Joking aside, providing visitors the opportunity to give feedback is a tried and true technique used by museum educators to reinforce personal meaning making as part of a cultural experience. And I'm thrilled that the Trust is asking its visitors what's important to them instead of dictating what it thinks should be important to them. So while in Scotland, the Trust is focused on engaging local families in order to develop lifelong relationships with the next generation, our work here in the U.S. is slightly different. My job is to capture Americans' imaginations and to inspire them to visit Scotland, to form or reinforce their own personal connections to the country, and then, of course, to support the Trust's work in preserving its irreplaceable history. The Trust's authentic places and objects are essential to helping me achieve this mission. On a recent trip to Scotland that we sponsored, one of my travelers was making a pilgrimage of sorts. Jean had visited Scotland many times and had undertaken a lot of genealogy research here and in the UK, but she had never visited Crathis Castle. Her great-grandparents, she told me, were the dairy farmers at Crathis for generations. And the look on her face as we approached the castle, as she was able to touch its walls, was something I'll never forget. We have made a lifelong supporter of the Trust pres Preservation Mission out of Jean. But more important than that, we provided her with an opportunity for connection that was real and meaningful. And we also found time to swing by the house where her great-grandmother was born, now a petrol station in Bankery. And it's not just the places. Objects, from a painted ceiling to a vacuum cleaner, tell stories that connect people to their heritage. Recognizing this, can I grab my Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Um, recognizing this, the Trust embarked last year on an ambitious initiative called Project Reveal, cataloging, thank you so much, John, and digitizing over 40,000 objects at 19 different historic properties to date. The goal of the project is not only to inventory all of the trust holdings, many of which have been hidden away in drawers or attics, but more importantly, to better position the trust to share the stories about Scottish culture and history over the decades that these artifacts tell so well. The Project Reveal team is made up of young museum professionals who are all getting hands-on experience in collections research and management. And they're doing it in full view of the public. This is another wonderful museum education technique that the Trust is using to more deeply engage visitors, conservation and action. Providing a behind the scenes glimpse of the work it takes to preserve these objects that are held in trust, pun intended, for future generations, strengthens our visitors' understanding and ownership of our work. 
these bonds are further reinforced by hands-on opportunities for the public, including Americans, to work alongside trust staff in the field. <coughs> While you won't be measuring and photographing objects yet, through the Trailblazer and Thistle Camp programs, teenagers and adults, respectively, can travel to Scotland and participate in an archeological dig, build a bridge at Glen Rosa, take soil samples on Ben Lars, or build a wall on St. Kilda. And this year, the Trust expanded its hands-on opportunities for the general public by hosting day-long archeological digs at Crappus Castle and Castle Fraser, among other properties. Just look at the number of future archeologists who dragged their parents to these historic sites, getting their hands dirty and discovering priceless artifacts that tell the story of their past. One shard from a French wine bottle <coughs> imprinted with the stamp of the Burnett family and found at Grappas this spring is a physical representation of the trade routes between France and Scotland and was deemed so important that it has been given to the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh for its collection. It was found by a child at an archeological dig. <coughs> because that's what cultural and artistic expression is all about at the end, isn't it? Sharing stories and building connections. And whether our members in America are captivated by the stories told by Robbie Burns or the stories told by Diana Gabaldon, the important thing is the connection they make with Scotland. This is not an intellectual connection, though to be sure there are plenty of names and dates to memorize. This is an emotional connection that you get when you see Old Lang Syne written in Burns' own hand. It's a feeling in your bones a feeling of belonging to something bigger than yourself. So I've talked a bit about the power of place and of objects and of conservation and action and technology and hands-on learning and stories and meaning making and connection. And I want to leave you with one more word, innovation. As you all know, Scotland's history is one of innovation. And its cultural heritage doesn't stop at the baronial period or with the Jacobite rebellion. It extends to today. Just look at the VN, VNA Dundee that just opened last month. <coughs> I'm incredibly privileged to be working with the Trust to conserve a masterpiece of early modern architecture, Charles Rennie McIntosh's Hill House. This house was actually located just up the hill from the library where the very first television set, which was invented in Scotland is uh, on display. It's another example of innovation. Macintosh is a distinctly Scottish artist whose influence is felt worldwide. Macintosh was inspired by and collaborated with his wife, Margaret MacDonald, a talented artist in her own right. And when I visit Hill House, I get that Middleton Place feeling. It's unlike anything I've seen, and it's beautiful. It's the stories that really enliven the interiors for me, like the children, the five children who grew up in this house. And they remembered later how grumpy Charles Rennie McIntosh got when their mother put yellow fl flowers in her hallway. It ruined his color scheme. And it's a story of innovation, of an architect who is pushing aesthetic boundaries with the help of new state-of-the-art material, Portland cement a risk that unfortunately hasn't paid off and over the course of the century has led to breakouts of dry rot all across the house. Knowing the importance of Macintosh and McDonald's work to the artistic heritage of Scotland, the Trust has embarked on an innovative plan of its own to encase the house entirely in a temporary mesh superstructure called the box which will allow the house to dry out while a new Harling material is developed and can be applied in full view of the public. So we have world-renowned art, a building that transports you to another world, into a fairy tale, personal stories of the people who built it and the people who lived there, opportunities for visitor participation and conservation and action, and innovation. 
projects like this one are what captures the imagination of the next generation, inspiring them to move forward as they move back, as they look back. And um, I'm happy to talk to you all in more detail about this project because it's um, one that's very close to my heart. Um, I'll just end by saying that we had a um, gardener from the National Trust for Scotland visit a couple weeks ago, and he shared with me that the entire staff, from the CEO to the cashiers in the gift shops, have been taking storytelling training in order to learn how to tell the stories of Scotland to their visitors. And I can't think of um, a better way to transmit our heritage to the next generation. Thank you so much for having me.